Council, ready of standing to receive the right worship from the man. Good evening, councillors, members of the public and officers. Please be seated. Good evening. Um, would members and members of the public please make sure that your mobiles are switched off or on silent. All present. In, all present, including members of the public, yes. Please note that this meeting is being filmed by students from the University of Lincoln. Whilst it is not to be shown live on the Council's website tonight, it will, will be avail, available tomorrow afternoon and will also be on LSG website. And our first item is apologies. And there's in, apologies from Councillors Bodger, Paul Grice, Councillor Kerry, Councillor Sprout, Councillor D. Grice and Councillor Williams. And so, item one, any declarations of interest? Uh, Councillor Gratrix? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I declare an interest in uh, the strategic plan, page 246, page 276, refers to the Lincoln Credit Union, as I am uh, a director of uh, Lincoln Credit Union. Thank you. Councillor Nunnison. Got a personal interest in allotments as an allotment tenant, so that comes under se several items. To two for Any more? Um, questions. Item two is questions from the public under Council Procedure 11, and has been non received. And, and item three, council, questions from councillors under council procedure rule 12, none received. Item four is extracts from committees, 4A. Sorry. Uh, I move, Mr. Mayor. Sorry for my inattention. Mr. Mayor. is executive the 5th of March is a Commons Advisory Panel revised constitution. Oh, Councillor Hill, sorry. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, I must admit I was surprised to see how many pages of our agenda are dedicated to this uh, item tonight and even more surprised to find another one in front of us. And firstly, I'd like to ask some rhetorical questions about um, this committee stroke panel. What is its purpose? Who does it report to? And is it a decision-making committee? And whatever the answers are to this, I'm not sure whether this is a sledgehammer to crack a peanut or a panel that is totally unconstitutional under our council constitution. And the reason I ask that is why does it appear that councillors feel they need to control and vote on a panel which, according to the tin, is an advisory panel? Amongst the minutes where this has been discussed, um, I think it was Councillor Denman raised the fact that representation on this committee was not politically balanced. The answer he was given was, as this was an advisory panel, they didn't need to. 
And if we look at it, all it actually says is five councillors. Now, being uh, the normal suspicious cynic, I would say, um, is this going to be five members of the controlling group, or are other people going to be allowed to have a look in? It also says that the chairman and the vice chairman are appointed by the council. It doesn't say whether they're councillors or whether they are members of the public or members of an interest group. It's very, very unclear. And experience I have with these panels is with the um, Household Country Park Advisors Group. And the way that group runs is totally different from what is suggested in these papers. And I do know that they wish this to be the blueprint for all advisory panels around the city. And if it is, um, I would very, very definitely vote against this as it stands. As things happen in the Hartshold Park advisory group, the chairman, vice chairman, all officers are members of the public. As far as I'm aware, there are no councillors appointed to the committee, and myself and Councillor Hewson, so we have a member of the controlling group and a member of the opposition, attend this as ward councillor and neighbouring councillor, mostly because we're interested in what's going on in the park. We do contribute, we do have our say, and if there is a vote, we do take part. But I think our presence there is firstly to listen, is to advise as far as we are able, and to facilitate the meeting and any outcomes from it. The meeting basically is between the members of the advisory group and the officers of this council. And as outsiders, we can choose the path we weave amongst it. And if, and this to me should be the way that advisory groups work. Advisory groups should be there to advise. There should not be any political interference with it at all. And because of the way this council would put five councillors and appoint the chairman and vice chairman, I would ask that this paper is referred to the Constitutional Review Group to actually ascertain whether it actually fits within that remit. If that is not granted, I would vote against it. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, some inter interesting comments from our Conservative colleague there, and it seems that the Conservative hostility to the Commons Advisory Panel continues. It's no wonder they were uh, received so badly by members of that panel. And when you think about it, Mr. Mayor, uh, it's not a surprise when you consider that the Tory MP, Mr McCartney, uh, I quote, sees the West Common as a development opportunity. It shows the difference in the perspectives of the different uh, political groups. Um, there's always been five members of the council on the panel, and two years ago there was four, four Conservative, one Labour. The, three, the following year there was three Conservative, one Liberal and one Labour and now there's four Labour and one Tory. And uh, it's a joke to say there should be no political interference. The Tories try to disband the panel, Mr Mayor, you may remember. But my, my comments are entirely positive. Uh, as Chair of the Commons Advisory Panel, I would like to thank the members of the panel for their enthusiastic input uh, into framing this constitution and it, we did it in good time. And also, Mr Mayor, I'd like to thank them for their enthusiastic input also into the Commons Management Plan, which we are uh, consulting on as we speak. 
And uh, the last thing I'll say, Mr Mayor, the meetings we've had since May of the panel have all been very positive and they run to time and very civilised indeed. So I'd like to thank the members of the panel for all their work. Councillor Heath. Um, I wanted to say a few words as a, as a former chair of this committee. Um, first of all, or advisory panel, should I say. Uh, first of all, I, I'm in no doubt as to what its, its function is, and its function is there to advise the, uh, the executive, to advise the council on all matters to do with, uh, with the, the common. But I do think uh, that Councillor Hills has raised a pertinent point about uh, political balance. And I think it's time for the council to consider whether it, if we're going to have councillors on it, then there should be a political balance. And if we're not going to have a political balance, maybe we should consider having no councillors on it at all and just leave the advisory um, panel to do what it, it, it's there, which is to advise the council. Um, um, the other point that I wanted to make is that on page 8, uh, about halfway down, there's a line that says the expectation shall be that all groups represented will have a constitution and be able to demonstrate uh, good governance. And that seems a bit woolly to me. I mean, an expectation that each group represented should have a, um, a constitution. I mean, it, they should either have to have one or they shouldn't necessarily have to have one. But uh, it, it says there's an expectation. So, you know, where, does, where is that going to leave groups who want to have a representative on the panel but don't have a, a, a constitution? Are they going to be forced to, to get one? Or are some of them going to be let off? Or are others not going to be let off? I don't think that's terribly clear. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say a, a few words about the whole issue of the constitutional, of the uh, uh, Commons Advisory Panel having uh, a constitution. I personally have never had a problem with that. I thought it was quite right that they should have a, a constitution. <coughs> Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think we need to be absolutely clear that the Commons Advisory Panel is absolutely vital to the good governance of our Commons, and I don't believe that there's anybody in this chamber that believes otherwise. I think it's absolutely vital that this panel is put together in such a way that it will support um, the Common, regardless of who's in control of the Council. It needs to run as independently of that Council as possible. It does, however, need to be inclusive and not a closed shop. I'm concerned that those commons are for the use of all residents of Lincoln, not just the people that currently enjoy it. I would like to see the um, opening up of the membership of this panel um, going wider. Why we don't have ward level uh, resident representation on this panel, rather than just keeping it to groups that have organised activities on there. I think that would be a real step forward to involve all of the residents of the city and not just organised groups. That being said, it seems that the membership of the panel is left entirely to the current members of the panel to determine before it gets escalated back to the council. Um, I'm reading from the Constitution. Um, it says there, recommendation of entitlement of a group to representation shall be determined by the panel by way of vote. So effectively they can say, well, we don't believe you are appropriate to be a member. Um, you then have got um, a situation where it doesn't ex specifically say whether the chair and vice chairman of the panel will be councillors or not. Well, question, should they be? And these are the kind of questions that need exploring a, a constitutional review group, and I don't believe they have been. It's yet another example, unfortunately, of coming up with decisions, as we found before the last election, um, or just after the last election, when we suddenly had a new scrutiny committee arrived at without any form of consultation, without it going through any kind of constitutional review group. And here we are again, changing and amending constitutions to very important bodies that affect all the residents of Lincoln, without going through what could be a much more robust process. And I would back Councillor Hills in asking that this go through Constitutional Review Group before a decision is put. Councillor Strangle. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I think Councillor Hills asks a very reasonable question of uh, the uh, executive member. Uh, I agree with Councillor Heath as well. There's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about the, the Constitution or lack of it. And I totally support Councillor Jones's uh, recent comments about the fact that we're not trying to get rid of the, uh, the panel in the sense uh, of just uh, getting rid of the body. We need to have a proper constitution. It's a shame that Councillor Murray has to try and politicise it for his own means because that's all he's done ever since he uh, represented the ward. And it isn't a political issue. It should be for all the members of uh, the city, as Councillor Jones mentions. And I, I quite uh, fully support Councillor Hills in what he uh, asked for in, the, uh, in his initial statement. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Mr. Metcalf, would you like to come back? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's almost a danger, isn't there, in um, overeating at the hors d'oeuvre stage of uh, any <laughs> proceedings? I get that sense this evening. Um, Councillor Hill says that um, he was asking a rhetorical question, so from that point of view, I would hardly feel compelled to, to answer Councillor Hills, but I will. Uh, yes, I can answer rhetorically, thank you. Um, purpose um, of the Commons Advisory Committee, you, you know its origin, it comes from the 1985 Act, as you know, that we entered into an undertaking at the passing of that Act, um, that certain prescribed organisations would advise the Council on what was best um, for the common, Commons. Um, the actual specific purposes and objectives of the Com uh, Commons Advisory Committee, of course, are set out uh, in paragraph 3 of the uh, Constitution, very clearly to advise the City Council, etc., to represent and protect the interests of all users uh, and take due regard to previous undertakings uh, given in 1985. So I think, actually, the, the, the purposes of the um, as advisory committee are very, very clear. Um, who do they report to? Well, they essentially report to council because they, they're advising the council, obviously for day-to-day uh, -day matters, that would be to the council's executive, but ultimately, as we're finding here in considering a, a constitution for um, the advisory committee, uh, ultimately to council. Uh, are they decision-making? No, quite clearly not despite the fact that um, there may be voting uh, from time to time to see what the um, convergence of opinion on any particular matter is. That's not unusual in advisory bodies to gain a, a, a majority view about any particular matter. So I think voting in and of itself doesn't make it a, a decision-making uh, body. Is it unconstitutional? No, because of course we've had many advisory bodies down through the years, as you know, advising the council on all sorts of matters. And we have other advisory committees um, as well as this one. Um, I think the issue about member involvement, of course, is a, an interesting one because um, I think that probably does lend itself to some muddying of the waters in relation to your question about whether this is decision-making, because obviously normally members uh, tend to sit on bodies that are decision-making, but not exclusively so. Uh, elected members, of course, represent the council on all sorts of organisations across the city, um, both to represent the interest of the council um, and indeed to um, uh, occasionally represent the interest of that organisation to the council. Um, no political balance, let's be clear, is required because this is not a formal committee of council. Let's uh, be quite clear about that. So there's no requirement for political balance. Uh, however, I, I think usually, I think we've been pretty flexible about recognising the particular interests, talents and commitments of members of different political parties and the uh, value that they may have uh, in serving to advise the council. So if people do have a strong commitment to all matters relating to the Commons, then no reason why um, elected members shouldn't uh, sit on the advisory committee, but quite clearly they are no other or different 
Committee than anybody else um, sitting as advisors to the Council when they're fulfilling that role on the Advisory Committee. Um, Councillor Heath, I think it was, raised the question of um, how robust we are with organisations who uh, purport to represent a wider constituency of interest. And I think this certainly is an issue, clearly. Uh, if the Council are going to give some credence and credibility to the advice it receives from particular constituencies of interest, then it clearly does need to know that, uh, that those views are reasonably uh, as far as one can ascertain, representative of that constituency of interest. So I think you have a, a, a point there, the extent to which we can insist as a council um, on all of the ins and outs of how well constituted, how representative they are, how often they consult with their members, of course, is problematic, it seems to me. Yeah. Will this item has been proposed and seconded. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? I think that is carried. Thank you. Item 4B is Executive 5th of March 2012, the Localism Act 2011 Pay Policy Statement. Councillor Maker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. In moving um, this item, uh, can I remind Council that it is now a requirement for all Councils to publish publicly its pay policy. Um, since the writing of this report and the, its publication as part of tonight's agenda, there are just perhaps two additions I would like to make to the report in front of you. If I can draw Council's attention to paragraph 6.3 on page 17. I would like us to insert there, after 6.3, uh, 6.4, and the wording to be inserted there would be, the City Council does not have a policy that would allow any employee to minimise their tax payments. Um, I'm sure the more uh, alert members of Council will be all too well aware that cases have come to light where um, there has been arrangements made for people to, um, if not evade, certainly avoid tax liabilities. And I think we thought it appropriate to include in our policy uh, a, a statement on, our, on the Council's view on such matters. The only other addition to the report is uh, in the third paragraph on the next page, um, after uh, the, what, what, what it says in your report, the, um, therefore the ratio between the chief executive's pay and the lowest paid employees is 8.9 to 1. This is considered to be acceptable at this time. I would like to insert the ratio between the chief executive's pay and the medium pay, that's the midpoint, is 5.1 to 1. And this is considered acceptable at this time. And with those amendments, Mr Mayor, I move. Thank you. I second, Mr Mayor, with the amendments. It has been proposed and seconded. All those in favour? Uh, Against? Item 5 is the medium term financial strategy 2012 to 17. <coughs> Mr Mayor, just a point of order, um, I'd like to move the suspension of standing orders to permit the Leader of the Council to speak beyond the allotted time of five minutes on this item, and also that the same facility be granted, well, I was going to say to the Leader of the Opposition, but he's not here, but to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Vote. It has been proposed and seconded. Will we vote on this? All those in favour? Aye. Right, that's carried. Council, I'm grateful for your in indulgence. Um, Mr Mayor, we face one of the, the, the biggest um, global economic crises um, we have known for a very long time. And um, this great city of ours is 
not immune to the effects of that economic crisis. Mr. Mayor, these are, these are pretty tough times for uh, a lot of people in this city, and I think they pose a serious challenge to the City Council and a challenge to which I believe this Council has got to respond. Tomorrow morning, 3,250 people in Lincoln will wake up desperate for employment. Many of them young people between the ages of 18 and 24 euros who perhaps have never had the opportunity even to get a foothold on the employment ladder or in the job market. Many people in employment, even lucky enough to be in employment, underemployed because of the absence of any alternative, uh, have had to accept part-time jobs working just a relatively few hours per week and of course joining the growing number of people in low paid jobs in Lincoln. 25% that's one in four council some four and a half thousand children in the city are in poverty in other words living in households with a household income of less than 60% of the average household income with all of the well-known effects, knock-on effects, on their educational attainment and on their health and the well-being of them and their parents. Significant disparities in health and well-being between rich and poor in the city, affecting, as we know, life expectancy and the incidence of life-limiting illnesses and disabilities. More than 3,000 people on our housing waiting list. Desperate, many of them, to get rehoused, and as we know, with an increasing number of people finding themselves homeless for one reason and another. Young couples, waiting almost indefinitely to try and get a foot on the housing ladder, and seeing their dreams of setting up home together getting further and further away. Mr. Mayor, I don't think this council can, nor should it, stand idly by and do nothing, at least to try and mitigate the effects of some of these problems. When the new council was elected last May, we rolled up our sleeves and we immediately set to work to work on some of these problems. We, worked, we launched a take-up campaign to help pensioners claim what is rightfully theirs and we've put in the pockets of some of the neediest and poorest of our older citizens something like a quarter of a million pounds, 250,000 pounds into the pockets of some of the poorest people in this city. We found the funds necessary to continue the excellent work being done by our three neighbourhood uh, management teams working to support local communities and tap into the huge amount of goodwill we know exists in many of our working class communities uh, around the city. We've begun building for the first time for nearly 20 years some council houses to start to make inroads into that desperate level of housing need that I've referred to. And we've contributed to the setting up of the, the new Visit Lincoln partnership to promote Lincoln and increase visitors to the city and help contribute to the vitality of the local economy. We brought 65 new allotments back into use to, to meet the ever-increasing demand for healthier lifestyles and to benefit people on low incomes in particular to produce their own food and contribute uh, in turn to a lower carbon footprint in the city. And we've begun to try and make things a bit better for our 8,000 council tenants um, providing a handyman's service for older and disabled tenants that will start on the 1st of April and making our council homes safer and freer from crime and anti-social behaviour. And we've also recognised that of course Lincoln is part of a wider world that has sadly neglected the longer term interests of the survival of our planet and have turned our minds, Mr Mayor, to how we can reduce the city's carbon footprint and act locally 
to meet the global challenge of climate change. So the key themes, Mr. Mayor, of the medium-term financial strategy and the budget for the coming year are the protection for people of some of the worst effects of the recession. Themes are about growing the local economy, about helping to create more jobs, about helping young people into work, and about the plight of hard-working low-income families, and about homes for people who desperately need them to rent or to buy and to make a start in life. The setting of this budget, Mr Mayor, has not been an easy task because, of course, we are in a context of not being in control of our own fate. Over the last two years, we've seen a 24% reduction in the support provided by government. In cash terms, about two and a quarter million pounds less from the government. And that's for a city among the poorest of cities up and down this country. We see the effects of the recession in the fall in income coming to the council across a whole range of, of its income streams. Now, in relation to the scale of these challenges, Mr Mayor, I would suggest that actually the spending outlined in the proposed medium-term financial strategy and the budget for 12-13 is actually modest. And for those members of council who might start to try and accuse us of extravagance, let me just point out that the net revenue budget proposed for 12-13 is 13.6 million. It's actually less than the budget pr uh, proposed this time last year by the Conservative administration at 13.7 million. So don't let me hear any cries tonight of extravagance by the Labour administration because actually we are setting a slightly lower budget this year than was set last year. And indeed, over the lifetime of the five-year medium-term financial strategy that's in front of you, um, the revenue budget is not expected to rise in real terms by more than around 2%. In fact, only going up to 14.2 14 14 million in 16-17, the final year of the MTFS. We're proposing a general fund capital spend of around 14 million an HRA capital spend on our council housing stock of around 61 million. There are not many organisations, Mr Mayor, in this city making these levels of investment. The present government, in my view, has got this completely wrong in relation to the public sector's role in the economy. Our current level of spending and the additional spending we propose will bring jobs and economic and social well-being to this city. And I think the importance and value of the contribution of the public sector needs to be recognised and celebrated in a way that I'm afraid this government uh, knows nothing about. The Council have developed a significant gap over time between its income and its expenditure. To state the obvious, we are a relatively poorly off city, as you know, with a very narrow tax base. 80% of our council taxpayers are in properties which are in the lowest council tax bands of A and B. Properties, for those of us unversed in these matters, that were worth at the last valuation in 1991 less than £52,000. We have an awful lot of very small terraced houses in the city uh, making very small amounts of, local, of council tax payments because they are in the lowest tax bounds. If you combine the cuts in government support, the, the effects on council income of the recession already referred to uh, have all combined to reduce income. And let's be clear, council, this is a story about a fall in income. The crisis between uh, what our income and expenditure is. This is a story about the fall in income rather than rises, unreasonable rises, as, some, um, as in some quarters might be alleged in expenditure. 
which accounts for the current gap between the Council's income and expenditure. And we've made already savings of 1.75 million, and the Council by April 2017 have uh, still to make a, a, a further uh, sum of money to achieve the total target savings of 2.75 million. Very good progress has all been made, already been made by the Council during 11-12, uh, the last year, actually resulting in an overachievement of the £750,000, which was the target for necessary savings. Councillor Heath, you might uh, reflect on this, because it was you, of course, who kept in office for a year longer than they ever deserved to be uh, a Tory administration on the basis of your belief that this council, this administration, couldn't make the difficult decisions, I think you said. Well, I just ask you to reflect on that conclusion that you drew at that time in the light of the fact that we have overachieved on the savings in our first year necessary to balance the council's books. A further £750,000 worth of savings have to be found in the coming financial year, and whilst this is without doubt another significant challenge, I'm pretty confident that with the plans we've already put in place, we can and will achieve that. We've got to secure a financially sustainable position for the Council, and certainly we also need to make provision for all sorts of contingencies that we know are coming our way in the next year or two. Mr Mayor, I've outlined some of the social and economic challenges the, the Council faces and far from being daunted by these, um, the new administration has renewed its vision for this city. We've identified a, a new set of strategic priorities and crucially, we've drawn up a plan to deliver these over the next couple of years. And we've consulted very widely and I think very meaningfully with a very wide range of people and we're confident that they command a large degree of public support. As Appendix 8 in the Medium Term Financial Strategy Papers in front of you, the delivery plan, as you'll see, requires some £393,000 revenue support and about £3.6 million capital expenditure. Against an extremely tight financial position, it has only been possible to achieve this through some very careful reallocation of existing resources. As I said, we are keeping within an envelope, uh, a revenue, net revenue budget envelope, which is less than last year. But this expenditure will show that this council recognises the hard times that people are having out there and, and is prepared to do something about it. Help for existing and new small businesses and social enterprises a £75,000 contribution to some new apprentices, a new take-up campaign advised, uh, aimed at reducing child poverty and help for first-time buyers seeking a mortgage, and investment in, further investment in allotments to respond to the hugely increasing demand for growing your own. Mr Mayor, we can consider some of those in a bit more detail when we come to the strategic plan later on in our agenda, but there are just two other matters finally which I need to refer to. Fees and charges, which is an important source of income for the Council, uh, are intended to be increased by an average of 2.3%, certainly below current inflation. There may be some variations within that, but that's the across-the-board average increase. And on the matter of Council tax, we are recommending, as you'll see from a subsequent recommendation in your agenda, to Council, no increase in the City Council's precept. The only precepting authority in Lincolnshire um, proposing an increase is the Police Authority, as you probably all now know. In terms of the medium to longer term sustainability of the Council budget, this is not by any means the best decision. I have to be honest with you, Council, uh, we struggled with this issue long and hard um, and certainly most sensible people I believe recognize even in hard times that useful valuable public services have to be paid for in some way 
Um, but given how hard pressed family budgets are, as we know at the moment, we think on balance it's probably the right thing to do to offer a further freeze of council tax in the coming year, and that is what is proposed later on your agenda. Mr. Mayor, budgets and financial strategies are not ends in themselves. Um, they are a means to an end. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, we cannot, and I believe we should not, stand idly by as people in the city struggle. I think this budget will bring some much needed help to a wide range of our citizens and I um, commend it to Council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Metcalf. Councillor Jones, would you like to respond? So, sorry, it's been seconded yet. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm very pleased to second this budget. Uh, it's, it's less than a year since Labour regained control of this council, and already there's a positive difference, which is very apparent. Um, the new initiatives introduced since May have been have been achieved by the reallocation of the council's resources, and what this budget does is, is to continue that process. It includes significant new ideas, which will be achieved despite having to make a further £750,000 worth of savings over 2012-13, and despite the fact that we are not proposing any increase in council tax for the residents of the city. This, of course, is on top of the fact that a number of improvements to services have been made since May, as well as an overachievement of the savings target. It shows very much that the financial management of the city is safe under Labour, and any suggestion to the contrary is ill-founded. Combating poverty and disadvantage is one of our key aims, and health disadvantage is as important in this as economic disadvantage. In my own portfolio holder area, it will be a big year. We've got the Olympic Games ahead of us, and Lincoln will benefit from this, primarily from the fact that there will be an increase in interest in sport and that the legacy afterwards will be that more people will want to take part in sport. And City Council officers are working hard to make sure that that can happen. And given the poor health statistics for the city, anything that can be done to encourage physical activity and participation in sport can only be of assistance. An example of the health statistics is the difference in life expectancy between Moreland Ward and the adjoining North Kisteven Ward, which is High Forum, and the difference in life expectancy is more than 15 years. And although a member of the opposition benches glibly commented that he didn't want to live a long and healthy life, I think that person is probably very much in the minority. Um, but this budget will continue the progress we've made since May, that there's um, improvements in allotments, um, there's some money set aside to work with the British Heart Foundation's Heart Cities project. And I'm hopeful that this partnership will lead to much bigger things. And there's also a significant sum for improvements to the grandstand. These are all things which make a difference as we leave behind the do-nothing years of the council, which began in 2007 and only came to an end in May 2011. Finally, I just look forward to hearing what alternatives the opposition group put forward if they put any credible alternative suggestions at all to this well-thought-out budget. So, I second Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And I said Councillor Jones. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm sure everybody will join me in wishing Councillor Gricewell, who's been taken into hospital, he was uh, due to be here tonight, but he's not, so uh, uh, I'm sure everybody will, will wish him well. Yes, D, that is, just to be clear. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for your uh, report, Councillor Metcalf. And I, I would have to say the one thing that uh, uh, I think we all are is uh, uh, truthful in our, our praise when it's there. And I would have to say the, there's a remarkable amount in here that's to be commended. And in fairness, there is very little uh, wriggle room, shall I say, in the financial situation to do an awful lot otherwise. So from that point, we would have to... Uh, uh, agree that the, there's a large amount of uh, work in here that would remain the same. So to, to answer Councillor Nanastad, what big alternatives? Well, there isn't a lot of room for big alternatives, unfortunately. What I would say, though, is, is as, as a lot of things are, the devil's in the detail. It's not always what you plan to do, but how you plan to do it, and how you plan to pay for it is always very important. Um, we look at living within 
your means, which is something that got the country into trouble not too long ago, the fact that this didn't happen for a number of years, which is why government's in the position of having to cut our grant in the first place. Yet what we see is an erosion of our uh, reserves. Year on year on year, our reserves are set to shrink and shrink and shrink, which arguably reserves are there, and as it clearly says, they are a matter of judgment as to how much reserves the council needs. Um, and let's be clear, this is public money and it is there to help the public. And I know that you would argue that that's exactly what you're spending those reserves on. What I would argue is that a budget that year on year erodes your reserves isn't a balanced budget. <coughs> there are some good things, as I say in here. The more local authority mortgage scheme to help first-time buyers is something that, um, as I've mentioned to you personally that we, we, we are totally in support of, and in fact this goes back to a long-held conservative ideal that people should be allowed, where appropriate, to have opportunity to um, purchase their own property. Um, and this is something that I'm glad that um, the Labour group are supporting, um, because that is clearly an ideal that we, we would promote and support. Um, what we would want to see is where the safeguards are for that public money that's going to be put aside. Um, we haven't seen an awful lot of the detail uh, outlined there, and we would want to make sure that the public money of some £2 million is protected to make sure that we're not going to see that just disappear, what prudence is going to be in place to manage that. We understand that a certain amount of the funding that was put aside for the leisure uh, sector is uh, been earmarked to support uh, some of the f extra things that you wish to fund in here, um, which you know is we entirely within your gift to move money around. It would be interesting to know um, how we're going to fulfil some of the promises that were made some years back in places like Car Home Ward regarding how we were going to spend money to enhance their leisure facilities. We've now got further 106 monies um, coming to that part of the city and still we're hearing on the streets that, that people are unhappy, that there is no provision in there, there's no shops even though they were promised. Those kind of things are needed for communities and we would like, rather than just taking money away to start new things, honour the promises that were already committed to years ago. We would like to see more money devolved down to community level and we, we can see through the report that it's, it's definitely the government's agenda to do that and I, obviously that's forcing uh, council's hands somewhat to follow that line but we would like to see council go beyond that, involve local communities much more in what their, the monies are going to be spent on in their local communities. Um, we saw a figure of some 105,000 that was earmarked for a city-wide community scheme. Well, that equates to some just under £10,000 per ward. Uh, it would be interesting to know how that's actually going to work. I would look for a fund that was much larger than that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think we've also got to be honest about where council tax freezes are coming from. For the last two years, government has provided us with the ability... To, to, for that freeze. Now that, that's obviously a Conservative government aim, it's something that you are passing on to the people of Lincoln and it's good that the people of Lincoln can benefit from that. If it was left, um, as you, you've just indicated to locally, we certainly maybe have, would have got a, a different result. So we need to understand where that money's coming from. It's government that's allowing us that facility to freeze it and you need to be honest about that. Um, Council houses, something that's dear to a lot of people's hearts, regardless of uh, which side of this bench they sit on. Um, it's really important as well to understand what's going to happen for the future. We've had a, a very positive start. We've got some council houses being built. As we all know, that's a drop in the ocean. Where's the next 50, the next 100, the next 150 coming from? And I think we all need to work together on that. And I do think that the way the budget is balanced, it really isn't giving enough emphasis to the housing market in that respect. And that's something that we would do. When it comes to um, the... Um, <coughs> excuse me. When it comes to um, the... Uh, excuse me. <coughs> When it comes to the overall budget, as I say, there's a lot of things in here that we can support. Um, there's a lot of aims, putting more money into local people's pockets, um, trying to create jobs. 
those kind of things are obviously going to be very well received by everybody. Equally, when we look at recent actions such as not protecting the businesses up at the lawn during the sale, things like that, then speak of a different uh, way forward. And I'm not comfortable with the fact that in one way we can promise something, but then actually our deeds are different to the words. Um, we talk about investment in the grandstand. Well, that's something that we'd already started to do, and it's a job that desperately needed finishing off. My question would be, why, did, why is it delayed a year for that desperate work for an iconic building to go forward? It seems to be so that it can be relaunched as a brand new project, which clearly isn't the case. There's an awful lot of good in here, but overall, it's not a balanced budget. It's eating into our reserves, it's living off tomorrow, and it's just not good enough to pass muster. It's not that we disagree with everything that's in it, we clearly don't, but it's just not good enough for our support. Thank you, Councillor Jones, and of course we do all wish Councillor Grice well, and we hope he's soon back with us. Councillor Heath. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Well, it's, uh, it's not often that I get first praised and then chastised in such rapid succession by the, uh, the leader of the council. And uh, so I want to start off by addressing the, uh, the comments that he, he made to me by uh, taking him back to that time when we met for <coughs> discussions. And, uh, and I recall leaving those discussions with very few notes made indeed. So reluctant was the, uh, the leader of the Labour group, as he was then, uh, to, to share or divulge anything of his plans. And, uh, and had he been more forthcoming, then he might have ended up with an outcome that was more to his liking. So I would in turn invite him to consider why he and his group is so reluctant to work with other people of different political persuasions from his own. But I don't want to uh, end on a sour note because um, I do th actually think that this is uh, a, a good piece of work. This is a good budget. And, uh, and I think that uh, what has been achieved here, or is proposed here, in very difficult and straitened financial circumstances, um, is uh, imaginative and uh, uh, addresses um, in, uh, in the best way that I think we, we can under these financial circumstances. Um, the, the circumstances of the, the poorest and the most disadvantaged in our communities. And uh, so I, I uh, applaud the controlling group for, for that. I would just like to make um, one uh, constructive suggestion. Uh, I hope it will be received as that. Um, given that we're discussing these things now, I was going to save it for the, uh, the strategic plan, but as I'm on my feet, I'll say it now. Um, one of the most important things uh, has been revealed to, to, <coughs> excuse me, to local communities is the issue of housing and the availability of affordable housing. And I wanted to ask uh, the leader of the council whether um, he and his group have considered the possibility um, of looking at self-build projects. Um, I, I don't have any uh, particular um, examples to lay before him. But uh, I do know that these, these sort of projects do occasionally uh, happen. And it may be a way of uh, addressing the shortage of affordable housing in this city while making our money go further. So that's a suggestion. Thank you. Councillor Tufany. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, council tax, no increase for the second year running. I think we're doing, we're doing something wrong. Um, I think that is very good news for the people of Lincoln and it's a good news for all of us because we all pay council tax. Nobody likes to see an increase. But perhaps the opposition, they need to be congratulated as well as this side of the table. But we need to set good example. Perhaps at the end of the meeting, Mr. Mayor, we need to shake hands to each other 
because a lot of player, football player, abuse each other and kicking a ball and never shake the hand. But can be shaken warmly by the floor. And the other thing, Mr. Mayor, is the allotment. At least we are spending some money on the allotment to encourage people to grow their own vegetable. But on the sad note, Mr. Mayor, I was called this morning on the Glebe, uh, Glebe allotment and uh, a few breaking. Some small minority people, perhaps they have nothing to do, middle of the night and break a few shed. But they haven't taken a lot of stuff. But as a council, what can we do? The allotment is very large. You can't fence them. If you do fence them, they still will jump over and break. But we do live in a society where a small minority like to vandalize and break other people's stuff. Thank you very much. Councillor Strangle. Well, um, thank you, Ralph. That was very interesting. And uh, I agree with you. I'm glad to see you're moving slightly right of centre now and what we would do with these people. I'll advise you later. Um, first of all, in true Chinese style, they're going to get the sweet and sour from me. I'm not quite sure which is the sweet and which is going to be the sour. First of all, I support the schemes on page 25. If you want to look at them, they're down there. I have a question for the leader of the council first. On 25, it mentions poverty and disadvantage, more affordable housing, reducing the city's carbon footprint and resilient economy. All of us in the opposition support those and always have done. So don't say that it's just in your remit as a controlling group that you have the vested interest in all those areas. It says underneath other, I've never seen a budget report with other unidentified amounts going to something. We need identification of what it is. You can't just put other. So that's the only question I'm going to be asking the leader. The rest is probably going to be the sour. You just don't get it, do you? You just don't get it. The Labour government for 13 years looked at boom and bust and run this country into a big, big deficit. You were in control before we took control in 2007. You were in for 26 years. So all of a sudden, all these unemployed and all these homeless are all the fact that it's the coalition's fault. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dream on, dream on, councillor. In austere times, you're going to find out that employers are also suffering. Everybody's had to um, uh, cut their cloth according. And you've had to pick up from what we left in 2009, uh, sorry, 2000, uh, I can't, I've forgotten, it's 2011. <laughs> Forgive me for that, Mr. Mayor. Slight senior moment. Um, 2011, you've had to pick up the same problems as we were dealing with. These are tough times, you're absolutely right on that. Housing waiting lists, you mentioned housing waiting lists. When we took control in 2007, there were 3,600 on the waiting list. I'd like you to tell me how many's on there now. About the same. No, just over. But anyway, the fact, the, the fact, the fact of the matter is, you didn't actually do anything about it when you were in control for 26 years. The waiting lists were going up and up and up. So don't just keep blaming the, the previous uh, administration. On the environment, when we took uh, control, we moved it from 46% up to 50%. I'm glad that you're continuing to do that, but these figures are actually moving in the right direction. You get less money from government. Well, there's a surprise. Everybody's getting less money from government. This is not uh, a conservative problem. It's a labour problem. 
boom and bust has always been your way. Spend your way out of debt, and that's what you're trying to do. And Councillor Jones is absolutely right, Mr. Mayor, when he mentions just using the money from reserves. Yeah, yeah, filter the piggy bank until it's all gone. It is the measures that this government are putting in place that will boost and improve this economy. It's like an oil tanker. It will take time to turn around, Mr. Mayor, but it's actually starting to move ahead. And when you mention things like uh, putting young people into work, apprenticeships and that, it's this coalition government that's actually driving that forward. So I'm just sorry to say that you are... You are actually, well, you're always going to be in denial, just like the last Labour government was in denial, you're still in denial. And until you do, now I wasn't intending to stand on my feet and be political. I wasn't intending to stand, I am standing, Mr Mayor, honest. I, I wasn't intending to be political, but it shows how much under pressure you are when you start your budget report by being political instead of delivering your decent budget or you think your decent budget is then maybe perhaps we wouldn't get political but don't blame it on us blame it on your side thank you mr mayor councillor gratrix thank you mr mayor well i would say it's a pretty good budget not all of it agree with but it is a pretty good budget because we live in tough times, as has been said tonight by many of the councillors. Uh, Councillor Metcalf started off uh, like a party polit political broadcast on behalf of the Councillor Metcalf party. And I think I preferred you, uh, Councillor Metcalf, at your patronising best. But we. Because, I mean, Councillor Strangle's just been speaking about the national picture, I'm concerned with the local picture because I'm a local councillor. I work with everybody on the council, the officers and the opposition people, because they're not enemies. We're here to try and do the best we can for the city of Lincoln. And if anybody disagrees with that, on my side or your side, then they're wrong. Right? So we've got a job to do. But don't when you stand up, Councillor Metcalf, don't be sort of indictive to us to say, oh, we can do it much better than you. We've got to do it together. We've got to do it together. You know it. Yes, you do. We've got to do it together. And if we don't do it together, this, this city is going to suffer. So if, we, if you're trying to make enemies of us, and you're just pulling by yourselves, okay, fair enough, off you go. But don't because it's going to, the city which is going to be harmed. And lastly, I think, Councillor Metcalf, that your attack on Councillor Heath was spiteful and vindictive, and it wasn't worthy of you. The fact is, is that she chose to do what she did, and you should forget about it. It's in the past. I don't live in the past. We've got to move forward. Thank you, Mr Mayor.